Good afternoon, and um, we're here today with Donna L. Shelton, uh, who's going to be presenting her presentation, Hope in Their Voices, What Slave Narratives Can Teach Us About Collecting Oral Histories in the 21st Century. Um, Arkansas Folk and Traditional Arts is very happy to have Donna sharing this presentation today. She's a heritage scholar at Arkansas State University um, who grew up in Morrow and Brinkley, Arkansas. Donna has um, two daughters, Nakila and Ajaya, and she has a master's of public history from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. Thank you so much, Donna. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, Lauren, uh, thank you for the introduction. I'd like to thank the Arkansas Folks and Traditional Arts Program and the Eddie May Heron Center for this opportunity to present this presentation. I especially want to thank also the, the uh, former and current residents of Garrett Grove, Arkansas. It's the town of my ancestors. I have learned so much from our communications and your willingness to share your memories with me. With that, I would like to talk about the importance of oral histories through the lens of the slave narratives of the 1930s. As part of the New Deal, President Franklin D. Roosevelt established the Works Progress Administration that aimed to put people to work during the years of the Great Depression. One of the projects that the WPA collected was to collect a document and document the memories of the formerly enslaved while they were still alive. So even though the interviews were not collected until sometime 60 years after the end of slavery. These firsthand accounts provide much needed insight into the lives of the emancipated, and they provide a wealth of knowledge about the so-called peculiar institution of slavery in the United States. In addition to their lives as enslaved labor, the memories of the interviewees also provide glimpses into the mindset of the newly freed. The formerly enslaved asserted their citizenship as they ran away across union lines, joined the military, registered to vote, became politically active, immigrated to other areas, looked for their missing relatives, acquired land and livestock, and established their own communities and towns. Later on in this presentation, I will introduce you to a community that practiced all of these actions. But first, I will provide a short overview of the historical debates about the value of narratives of the formerly enslaved. Since the formerly enslaved left very few records compared to other social groups, the inner workings of the daily lives and ideologies of this group is constantly debated among historians and scholars. The following are three examples of scholarship that provide evidence as to why the viewpoint of the oppressed is of essential importance in historical interpretation. Examples of this scholarship that utilize the narrative of the former, former slaves include John Blessing Arms, The Slave Community, Randall Miller's Dear Master, Letters of a Slave Family, and Carl Money Holmes, The Slave Family in Arkansas, a journal article written in the Arkansas Historical Quarter. Lesson I am focused on narratives of fugitive slaves, while Miller examined letters from two sides of an African-American family known as the Skip With family. One side had been liberated and living in Liberia in Africa, and the other side was still enslaved on a Southern plantation. In Money Holmes' assertion, he took a closer look at the WPA slave narratives and provide varying pictures of the lives of the formerly enslaved right here in Arkansas. Each of these works utilize the firsthand accounts of the formerly enslaved, not as secondary narratives, but as principal perspectives, giving voice to the oppressed, not just the elite class. In opposition to Blessing I, Miller and Money Home, some scholars are extremely critical of slave narratives. Some of the criticisms of such narratives include the following. For narratives recorded by runaway slaves, they debate their value because they were largely written by white abolitionists. They question the authenticity of these narratives, and they also question the value of the historical accounts. 
Likewise, Veneris is collected by the WPA in the 1930s. Some debate their value because they were collected over 65 years after the end of the Civil War. They were written by majority white authors. Even some of these authors were descendants of slaveholders. And they also question the value of the historical accounts. But one notable exception to the criticism of historical credibility of slave narratives is the narrative by Solomon Northrop, known as 12 Years a Slave. The highly popular narrative was also released as a major motion picture in 2013. Louisiana historians Joseph Logstow and Sue Ekin researched accounts of the narrative in the late 1960s and found historical documents that verified the information found in the book. So unlike other slave narratives, Northrop's account is considered historically accurate. Though Northrop's story is an incredible documentation of the horrors of slavery and the precarious state of even free African-American men and women, it provides a unique and singular story. The collective story of a community cannot be fully ascertained strictly by historical documents. Scholars from various disciplines have begun to conclude that interdisciplinary approaches are necessary. My position is that as long as we keep valid criticisms in mind, we cannot simply dismiss other slave narratives. International archeologists and anthropologists, anthropologists, sorry, Lynn Meskel tells us in the book, Global Heritage, a Reader, without archeology, span geography, or ethnographic research, heritage scholarship is likely to remain intellectually thin. So if Northrop's story passes the test of historical accuracy because of supporting historical documents, then if interviews with former slaves pass the same test, then surely the historical value also becomes evident. And considering a firsthand account is indeed deemed historically accurate, then any information the individual reveals can not only inform us about the lives of the formerly enslaved, but also provide clues to their ideas and ambitions as free citizens. So I applied the Northrop test to my own research and what I found was the examination of slave narratives can provide a basis for scholars and communities to apply important skills to the field of folklore, oral histories, and ethnography by utilizing a multidisciplinary approach to the study of the African American family. Collecting oral histories from family members and others can provide a wealth of information for anyone who desires to document community history. A personal example, example of the importance of conducting oral histories unfolded for me a few months ago. Over 10 years ago, I was researching the Rosenwald schools in the Arkansas Delta. These were schools built specifically for African-American children by African-American communities with matching funds from a foundation established by Julius Rosenwald, the founder of Sears and Roebuck. One of these schools was built by the residents of my ancestor's town, Garrett Grove. Fast forward to a few months ago, I posted an appeal on Facebook to find former students of that school. To my surprise, one of my uncles replied, how well do I remember? I went to school down there as a little boy. I was excited and I must admit a little ashamed at the same time when I read his comment. I spent all this time examining records, and I had even presenting my findings at conferences focused on the grassroots efforts of African Americans who raised money to help fund and build hundreds of Rosenwald schools in Arkansas. Even though I'd had numerous conversations with my aunts and uncles about family history and about Gary Grove, it never occurred to me to ask any of them if they had attended the Gary Grove School. So let me tell you a little bit more about the town of my ancestors. In the Delta, nestled between Lee and Monroe counties, 
is a small community known as Garrett Grove. It was cultivated and built by the emancipated. So I'm originally from South Carolina, Mississippi, Tennessee, Arkansas, and other places in the South. Although there are hundreds of all black towns that were established following emancipation, records are very scarce for a myriad of reasons, but Gary Grove can be an outlier. Gary Grove was established between 1891 and 1903. This is gonna uh, require further research on my part. Uh, it had at least two churches, one an African Methodist Episcopal church and another a Baptist church. I had a cemetery which still exists, at least two grocery stores and numerous self-operated and owned farms. Residents were extremely active in civic organizations such as a, a cemetery association that is still active to this day, fraternal organizations and politics. And as I mentioned before, they raised funds to build a Rosenwald school for their children. So I wanted to learn more about the community and what I could glean from census records and land deeds was not enough. Even with their limitations, the slave narratives are the most extensive collection of documents of their kind. So years ago, while researching my family history, I began to search the narratives. I was overjoyed when I found not one, but two of my ancestors among the Arkansas slave narratives. Both of these ancestors were also former residents of Garrett Grove. Diana Rankin is a distant relative through marriage and Isaac Crawford is my second great grandfather. For Rankin, I was able to verify historical information that she listed in her account. And like Northrop, her account reveals context only available through oral traditions. Like Rankin, information in Crawford's interview is also historically accurate and his regulations reveal insight into his motives unavailable in any other type of written document. Here's a little bit more about what I learned about Diana Green Turner Rankin. She was born about six years after emancipation. So some of the information in Diana Rankin's narrative were stories passed down by her parents, but her accounts are remarkably historically accurate. After emancipation, Diana's father, Solomon Green, continued to work for their former slaveholding family, the Hayes of Shelby County, Tennessee. The Hayes owned land not only in Tennessee, but also in Mississippi and Arkansas. Diana's narrative gives some insight into why Solomon may have made the decision to remain with his former slaveholders. Part of her narrative says, when Papa came from the war, it was all over. We know it was freedom. Everybody was in a stir and talking and going somewhere. He had got his spill of freedom in the war. He said they turned us all out to freeze and starve. Census records and farm schedules revealed the Greens family migration patterns while directly tied to the work assignments and economic conditions of the Hayes family. When Jackson Hayes lost his land, the Greens pursued other opportunities. Some like Diana remained in Arkansas and other descendants migrated to Kansas and Missouri. Diana's family history reveals a complex and dubious master slave and then later plantation owner and tenant relationship. It's hard to place in any one category, but Diana's memories help give Solomon's voice and much rich context into the conditions and values and structure of his family. And even more importantly, into his key motivations. Moving on to Isaac Crawford, my second great grandfather. Earlier, I discussed how historians considered Northam's account credible. The same can be said for Isaac Crawford's interview. His narrative confirmed some of the oral history that had been passed down through my own family about the Crawfords, the Samples, and their lives in Holmes County, Mississippi, and later as free people here, right here in Arkansas. 
Information found in the document is also in line with information contained in census records and other historical documents. Isaac says, I was born the first year of the Civil War. I was born and raised in Meriden Holmes County, Mississippi. My parents was named Harriet and James Crawford. They belonged to a widow woman, Miss Sally Crawford. I farmed till I was 18, then I made then they made me foreman over the hands over the place. I stayed to after I married. I've been farming all my life. I come here to farm, better land and no fence law. Isaac and his wife, Georgiana Sample Crawford came to Arkansas to become landowners and they finally achieved their, grow, their goal of becoming landowners in the town of Garrett Grove. In the narratives of Nortrum, Rankins, and Crawford, we see families operate under unequal social and economic systems. They each make keen observations, analyze the actions of individuals and institutions, and make critical decisions that affected their family's livelihood. These experiences help shape them and their offspring. In my opinion, one of their ultimate acts of resistance occurred when they shared their stories in their own words. So what does it mean for us today as we document histories and our family stories? As is evident in the collection of the WPA narratives, the experiences of slave families was not a homogeneous one. And likewise, for families following emancipation. The psyche of African-American farmer owners, business operators, educators, and community leaders who survived on the other side of slavery cannot be accurately ascertained without the discourse and the memories of African-Americans, especially their own descendants. Emancipation did not produce former slaves. Emancipation made way for activists, politicians, doctors, nurses, educators, military heroes, community leaders, and more. Gare Grove was no different. This small community instilled values that produced educators like Mrs. Savage, who taught black children in the 1950s and 60s in the Gare Grove school when they were not allowed to attend public schools. It produced numerous, numerous military heroes like Frank Miller and agricultural leaders like Leonard Broadway and Joe Smith. The formerly enslaved who later founded Gary Grove provided a safe space for future leaders in their own community and beyond. The town produced community organizer and activist, Gertha Bailey Trice, who was recently honored by Lee County with the renaming of a road in Garrett Grove in her honor. This is a t-shirt uh, that was produced by her family uh, that we wore at the, uh, the recognition that was well-deserved for this community leader. Uh, Garrett Grove also produced other leaders and farm owners and operators like Reverend E.M. Little and Trenton Trice, and even Arkansas State University's first African-American homecoming queen was from Garrett Grove. Her name was Marilyn Broadway. These are just a few examples of the remarkable people honored through the memories and narratives of the descendants of Garrett Grove. There are so many more. I could not list them all, but I do want to mention a couple of others like Robert H. Slaughter and Jesse Garrett, who were founders and leaders in early Garrett Grove. Uh, in fact, they donated the land where the church, the first church and the cemetery were built. Um, Ola Mae Turner Klein, who is also my cousin, was a civil rights activist in the 1950s and 60s. Um, she was very active and honored by Brinkley, Arkansas, a few years ago for her work in getting people to vote and registered and going to the polls. So stories like this, I've learned from ethnographic practices and oral history interviews. Put plainly, conversations with former residents of the town. So I implore you, don't discount the memories and stories of your relatives, friends, and neighbors. Listen to them, write them down, firsthand accounts, 
and oral histories provide rich insight into the actions of a collective community. They also provide context that census records and land deeds cannot. Scholars Barbara Allen and William Montell said in their book, From Memory to History, orally communicated history can reveal the human side of the past. Also by showing how historical events, international, national, or local can dramatically change the course of an individual's life. So what can slave narratives and other oral traditions teach us about documenting histories in the 21st century? Except that no one is better suited to present the heritage of the underrepresented than the people themselves. Be prepared, respect your topic and your subjects and organize your research. Adhere to a code of ethics and promise to do no harm. Be honest and transparent with conversation partners and be willing to build trust and connections. Recognize your own bias, we all have them, and connections to your subjects and your community. Document your findings and share with your community and conversation partners. This photo was taken in the 1940s. And this is a group of Garrett Grove citizens in, one of, in front of one of the churches. The memories and the experiences of these former residents of Garrett Grove have provided me a wealth of information about the culture of their and my ancestors. The discovery of facts surrounding the origins of the town continue to unfold. As the aspiration of these founding families continue to come into focus, I feel their influence more and more. Garrett Grove is only one of many all black communities established by African-Americans in search of a space of their own in the United States. Whether emancipated before or during the Civil War or not until Juneteenth, the history and heritage of the formerly enslaved cannot and should not be understated or limited only to the perspective of their former slaveholders. When the descendants of the emancipated are able to tell their stories, we shine a light on all unknown communities like Garrett Grove, places of solidarity, places of their own making, but only if we listen to the hope in their voices. Thank you for listening. Oh, thank you so much, Donna. That was, that was absolutely wonderful. Um, do you mind if I ask you a question? Oh, absolutely. Go ahead. Um, first, I want to just take a second and emphasize something that you said that I think is just really important, which was um, you said context that's only oral histories provide context that's only a, available in that way by listening to people mm -hmm. say things in their own words. And I, right. I just wholeheartedly agree with that and just wanted to emphasize it. Um, but Thank I'm wondering you. what what's the how is the um, process of gathering newer information in oral history from your family members about community history? How how has that been? Have they been has that been a fun experience to learn that information? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for asking that uh, because I didn't have time to go into that in the presentation. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, when I realized that even though I'd had all these conversations with my family about uh, family history, that I uh, that was lacking in my research of being very uh, intentional about some of the questions that I should have asked. So just recently, I've started collecting um, oral histories and, re and recordings. Um, a few months ago, I was able to record um, the near the. Uh, uh, interview my uncle that I mentioned, uh, Reverend uh, Ivory Mitchell. And so he provided so much information about growing up in, in near Garrett Grove as a small child and when he was older. Uh, the same for uh, one of my other aunts, uh, Joel Gaston, uh, was able to share her memories as well. And so I've actually had a online Facebook group that is a community history group specifically for former residents of the town of Garrett Grove and current residents, because there are a few people that still live in the town. And uh, we encourage uh, people to share their memories, share their photos, share their stories. And so I've 
gathered so much information from people sharing what they remember and the history that was passed down from their own family members. And so uh, I'm continuing that oral history project. As a matter of fact, uh, um, I'm continuing, I'm going to be interviewing some of the Trice family that is descendants of Gertha Bailey Trice. Uh, I'm going to be actually interviewing anyone from the area, whether they grew up in Garrett Grove or have knowledge of Garrett Grove and visit it. Um, it's ongoing research is going to take uh, a lot of time, but it's going to be time well spent because what I've gathered so far has been so invaluable. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. It's, I, mm -hmm. I, I really feel strongly about this, this type of work where we're going back and making sure that these African-American communities in Arkansas, that their history is, is known because there's just been so much uh, denial and erasure of these communities that I, I'm just really, thank you so much for sharing this work thank with you. us. Thank you. Have anything? I really appreciate it. You want to add before we, before we leave? I just want to, again, thank the uh, residents of Garrett Grove. Uh, as I've told them before, this is an ongoing project. Uh, the oral history is only part of it. We do hope that one time at uh, some point that we'll be able to establish some support to save the uh, the church and the cemetery that are still there. Uh, it's going to take money. It's going to take resources, but we are committed. So I want to thank uh, all of the supporters of Garrett Grove. Uh, you have been wonderful. And then I also want to implore, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, anyone who is interested in community history or family history, you do not have to be uh, a trained uh, professional to sit down and record the memories and the in your family history. Uh, find out as much as you can. Uh, if you want to uh, learn more information, uh, Lauren, the program with the Arkansas Folks Traditional Arts has been very instrumental in helping communities uh, figure out on how to best document these stories. We need to know you, these stories because I know people internationally who want to know about small towns like Gary Crow because no matter where you are, the history is important and we can't let it die uh, with the people who lived it. Absolutely. And my email will be down in the uh, description. So anybody that wants to know informa more information about Arkansas folk and traditional arts um, can, can contact me that way. So great. Thank, you, so Thank you again.